Well, thank you very much, Inas, for your kind introduction, and uh, thank you, Father Alexander, and the evangelization team for this invitation. Very happy to share some reflections with you this evening. The topic for this evening is the Mass, which is the Church's most important act of prayer and worship. Most of the services you will find scheduled in a Catholic Church are Masses. There are other church services, we also speak of liturgy, by which we mean the public worship of the church, but Holy Mass is really at the heart of the spiritual life of Catholics. When we speak of the Mass, we mean the ritual celebration, which has a certain structure and sequence of prayers, readings, and chants that developed over the centuries. The word comes from the Latin formula of dismissal at the end of the service, ite missa est, go, this is the dismissal. We also speak of the Eucharist, a Greek word that means thanksgiving and has been in use since the beginnings of Christianity. The word Eucharist conveys that giving thanks and praise to God for his countless blessings, especially for Jesus Christ and his work of salvation is at the heart of the liturgy. I'd like to approach our topic with a phrase taken from the writings of Pope Benedict XVI, who hailed the Mass as the Feast of Faith. What do you associate with a feast? When I looked up the word in a dictionary, the first meaning that came up was a large special meal, often for many people to celebrate someone or something. By feast, we also mean something that is very enjoyable to see, hear, experience, etc. And more specifically, a feast is a day on which a religious event or person is remembered and celebrated. What makes a feast special is the fact that we cannot simply make it up. There needs to be an occasion or a reason for a feast. And this reason needs to be objective. It needs to be something given. You share in the joy of a wedding, a baptism, a significant anniversary, or you commemorate an important event for a city or a country. What makes a feast special is the fact that it suspends our daily routine, helps us to articulate our deepest aspirations, and so offers meaning to our lives. When we look at feasts in the world's religions, we find that in different ways they communicate people's hopes and desires for forgiveness, reconciliation and peace by connecting with the divine. We get a sense that the human person is often divided within and that human relationships are often flawed. We also get a sense that these ruptures are ultimately rooted in our falling away from the God who created us and on whom we depend to make sense of our lives. In response, religions have found forms of worship that are intended to express and, if needed, restore our relationship with God, with one another, and with ourselves. In the history of the people of Israel, which we can follow in the Old Testament, we find such forms of worship. Usually, they involve the ritual offering of an animal or the produce of the land to God in sacrifice at a holy place, as in many other religious traditions too. A religious sacrifice is always linked with a meal. Some scholars even see the essence of a sacrifice as sharing a meal with God. One of the most important occasions of such a sacrificial meal was the Passover. To remember the liberation of the people of Israel, from slavery in Egypt, a lamb was offered in the temple of Jerusalem, and this lamb would then be eaten together in the household in a prayerful ritual meal. The Passover meal, known as Seder, is still celebrated by Jews today. In the course of the Old Testament, the idea of sacrifice gained spiritual depth. The prophets made clear that anything we could offer to God, which belongs to God anyway because he created it, cannot really mend the torn threads of our relationships with God and with one another. Only God himself can repair what has been broken. And this is why Jesus Christ was sent into the world. 
He is God, the eternal Word, who shared our human condition even to death on a cross, so that we may become capable of sharing divine life. He offered his life and so paid the debt we really owed to God. In doing so, he triumphed over sin and evil, and his definitive victory was made manifest in his resurrection from the dead. And this is what we are celebrating in the Eucharist, which in the words of Pope Benedict is the feast of the resurrection, which bears within it the mystery of the cross. Now, Jesus instituted the Eucharist on the night he was betrayed, as the Apostle Paul writes, before his arrest, trial and execution. He assembled the twelve apostles, his closest circle of disciples, for the Last Supper. This was a religious meal in which Jesus anticipated his self-offering on the cross by identifying the broken bread on the table as his body and the poured cup of wine as his blood, and by giving his body and blood to his disciples to eat and drink. Jesus also commanded his disciples, and this includes the church throughout the ages, to repeat the ritual action over bread and wine with his words. Thus, we would not only remember his saving death, but also receive a share in its saving effects here and now, and a pledge of future fulfillment in the heavenly kingdom. Thus, the Eucharist, whenever it is celebrated, makes available to those who take part in it the reconciliation Christ won once for all on the cross. The Eucharist also makes present the mystery of Christ's resurrection, because it is the living and risen Christ who becomes present under the appearances of bread and wine. The Eucharist is the greatest gift Christ has left us because it is the gift of himself. The Last Supper determined for us the content of the Eucharist, but not yet its form as a liturgical service. This form developed in the early history of the Church under the guidance of sacred tradition. There are different historical rites of the Mass which were shaped by many social, cultural and even political factors. The most widely used rite of Mass in the Catholic Church is the Roman rite, which is linked to the city of Rome, the see of the Pope, as successor of the Apostle Peter and head of the Catholic Church. This rite has a long and rich history which we can't explore here. However, all these different rites that exist have at their core what Jesus instituted at the Last Supper, and they follow a basic structure which is already attested by the middle of the second century. The structure includes biblical readings, preaching, preparation of bread and wine, wine mixed with water, a long prayer of praise and thanksgiving offered by a bishop or priest in which the offerings of bread and wine are consecrated and become the body and blood of Christ, and the reception of the Eucharist as Holy Communion by the faithful. The liturgy of the Mass has an inherent beauty that can speak to us without many explanations, especially when it is celebrated in a prayerful and reverent way. However, when we have a clearer idea of what is going on, we will be able to participate in it more fruitfully. Above all, we should be aware that something great is happening there, something that goes beyond anything we could construct or invent. When we assist at Mass, as it used to be said, when we are joining the worship God of God that is already taking place in the heavenly Jerusalem, in the assembly of countless saints and angels, we really join something that goes far beyond anything that we could, through our own feeble efforts, construct. This is plain especially in the introduction to the singing or praying of the Sanctus. This Latin word Sanctus means holy, and the Sanctus is one of the stable parts of each Mass that is really part of um, every Mass that's celebrated. The words are largely taken from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, and it is a hymn sung by angels in praise of God. In Jewish and Christian liturgy, the Sanctus is understood to manifest the union of earthly and heavenly worship. But this union is not something we should take for granted. Rather, it is already God's gift that we can join the worship of the angels and saints. And so in the 
introduction to the Sanctus, the priest prays on behalf of the whole church that our voices join with theirs, the voices of the angels and saints in humble praise. Now, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, as the Apostle Paul writes in another context, and you will find that perhaps not every celebration of the Mass is really transparent to this great spiritual reality. The liturgy of the Church is, we believe, a divine action, and it is the work of Jesus Christ, who is our eternal High Priest, but the human actors in it do not always rise to that occasion. But I hope you will be able to experience, and perhaps you have experienced already, that the Eucharist truly brings us closer to God than anything else in this world. Of course, the worship of God, which finds its greatest expression in the Mass, is not limited to going to church. Liturgy is important because it brings us into the right relationship with God and with one another, and its true meaning and relevance goes far beyond the actual church service. It embraces our whole life. The fruit of our prayer and worship is seen in practicing love of neighbor and correctly understood love of ourselves. Finally, I'd like to invite you to Google Order of Mass Catholic. Order of Mass Catholic. You will find plenty of websites that have what we call the Order of Mass, that is the stable recurring parts of the liturgy. Try to familiarize yourselves with this order of Mass. Take some time to reflect and pray about some of the texts you find. I'm sure you will find this helpful for entering into the spirit of the liturgy and making the most of its blessings. Thank you very much. Thank you.